will talk a little bit about Bitcoin and blockchain, but um, the real content of this talk is privacy. Privacy in the machine age. We live in a day and age where everything we do is monitored by someone, by something, by some device. It's either our mobile phone, it's our Fitbit, um, uh, it could be any camera anywhere. And some people, um, the data is scattered around, but some people, is, some institutions are always tracking us. And it's getting more and more as we're entering the age uh, of the Internet of Things. Our fridges, our toasters, our everyday lives, uh, even our kitchenware, um, is being connected to the Internet. So it's easier to monitor even our um, purchasing behavior and our eating behavior, etc., etc. So what does privacy mean in this digital age, in the machine age, uh, where we live in a data-driven world? I think we need to talk about digital human rights. And when I talk to people, especially to lawyers, uh, about uh, digital human rights, they shout at me, or they're quite upset. No, they don't shout at me, but they're quite upset, and they say, that's, that's bullshit. Uh, there is no such thing as digital human rights. We have human rights, and they apply to the digital age. Well, I couldn't agree more. The problem is that a lot of people in this world like to stick to the letter of the law not the spirit of the law. And um, in the light of that, I do think that we need to redefine um, our human rights, given the fact that we live in a data-driven world. So what does privacy mean anyway? If you look up in dictionaries or any kind of definitions, it's the state of being free from public attention. It's the state in which one is not observed or disturbed by anyone, which means that I should be able to be safe in the privacy of my own house without fearing that anyone can just walk in the door, including the police. The police can also only come into my house if, and if they have been able to prove that I might be endangering a general public. Other than that, uh, the sanctity of my home uh, should be assured. The same applies to when I write letters. I should be able to trust that nobody opens the letters except for the recipient, etc., 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 including eavesdropping on my phone conversations. So this is something we fought for for a long time, and this is what we refer to, I assume, privacy when we talk about it. But a lot of people, it seems, have given up on the idea of privacy, and we hear things like we live in a post-privacy world, including myself. And you'll hear about this uh, later on. But I think we don't really live, or we shouldn't live, in a post-privacy world. And privacy was always a relative thing, as we can see from this picture. <laughs> that thing happened even before the internet. So we always had neighbors who tried to maybe look over the fence and see what we're doing. We had other people trying to figure out what we're doing because they were nosy, because, um, I don't know, jealous, uh, or maybe a state as you just mentioned, uh, that maybe wanted to control us and see what political behavior we're showing. So, um, in order to avoid that, we instated um, these privacy laws that we have in democratic institutions. But uh, privacy uh, was always a relative thing, as we can maybe see from this picture. Now, I'm from um, a city, but I have a lot of people friends who come from the countryside and they came to the city and they left the countryside because they didn't have any privacy back home because everybody knew everything about everyone so they moved to the big city there they had privacy even though there were much more people um, they created their own filter bubble not a new thing by the way it's not uh, due to facebook they created their own filter bubble in the big city where they only mingled with people um, that um, that they liked, and the rest of the people didn't care because there was too, there's too much noise in the city. You can't care about everyone. So in a, in a very absurd way, even though there are more people, you have much more privacy. And then in the 80s, this happened, the internet. Back in the 80s, 90s, when a, um, a computer screen would still look like this, the first early adopters of the internet used it, among others, because they had a lot of privacy there. You could create your alias and be anyone and talk to this random person, and you 
didn't have to be ashamed of your interests, of your attitude, or you could, um, it, you had full anonymity, you had full privacy, and a, pe a lot of people liked that and played around with that. But then the internet became a big thing and got mass adoption. We started calling it the information data highway. And then companies started building products and then the Web2 became a thing. And we had Wikipedia, we had Amazon, we had um, um, Facebook and everything that uh, came afterwards. And we have really cool services based on the internet today. That's the good thing. But the problem is, the internet is fundamentally broken. It's fundamentally flawed in a certain sense. Um, why is that? Well, three reasons. Reason number one, the internet, the web one, let's say, was built around the idea of freedom of information. The idea was to connect all the computers and um, allow the access to information should have, uh, the idea was to democratize information. And information was free. People put all kinds of information for free online. So when the internet became bigger and when the web 2 became a thing, it was really hard to charge for services or information online because nobody wanted to pay for it. And what happened is that we started consuming all these services like Facebook or MySpace before that, etc., etc., um, newspaper articles, Wall Street Journal, um, Guardian, they're doing investigative journalism, yet nobody wants to pay for, for it. So we have to pay somehow, and today we pay with our privacy. The second reason web is fundamentally flawed is that it was never built with an inbuilt layer of cryptography. It was never built to be really fully private. You don't need big skills to eavesdrop on somebody's um, email communication. It's not rocket science. If you know your way around the internet, it's quite easy to figure out who is doing what and who is sending which information to who. We have privacy products now, but they were built on top of the, the original internet, and they're not built into the private layer, uh, into the native layer. And the third reason why the internet is um, broken is because we have no control over our data. And why is that a case? Because information is stored centrally. We first had the computer, and they used to look like that. Sometimes they were bigger. And before, before we started connecting all these computers together, so the only way to get information from one computer to the other computer was this little device, the floppy disk. So I had to actually save the data on that computer, then there was a second copy on that floppy disk, and then I had to walk over to another computer, insert it, and then a copy would be created on that other computer. And the only thing the internet did was to replace that by a communication protocol that would allow you to send files from A to B. But when we do that, every time we send an email, every time we upload information to Facebook, a copy of our information is sent to that other computer, to that other server. And when it arrives there, the moment it arrives there, we lose control of what happens with that data. And so, in a way, even we, all these data, they live in the different data silos, they live on servers which uh, companies control, uh, different companies or different people or different individuals. The moment I start communicating online with someone else, copies of data get stored somewhere else. And if we use services, whether it's my bank or if it's Facebook or it's Amazon, um, a lot of our data is stored on those data silos. And if we don't pay for our services, well, there is data slavery, we pay with our data, in a way. So, what does that mean? It means that, unfortunately, even though we have a lot of really cool services in the internet, and I think the internet was a great thing that happened, but it also brought us a lot of problems. For example, here we see a screenshot that shows us that um, the Brexit, um, um, the Brexit campaign might have had some links um, to Steve Bannon's company, and there was some meddling and interference with uh, the election campaign based on our data. Um, and I don't have to explain the fact what happened this year with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, we all know that. 
So because of these things that are happening, people are getting more and more aware that um, privacy is an issue, and we're asking ourselves what to do. And policymakers are advocating for the right to be forgotten, especially here in Europe. While I understand the need to advocate for privacy, I don't think the right to be forgotten is a feasible thing, given our current technology. However, I do think that we need to talk about encryption. It's a technology, um, it's a science that we've had for, for decades, but we're, we're not really using it on a native layer of the Internet. And one of the reasons we're not using encryption as much as we could or should is because at some point in time, that happened. 2001, 9-11, and when that happened, this happened. Um, the Homeland Security Act. And when this happened, one of the effects of the Homeland Security Act was that encryption became quasi-criminalized and a quasi-indication um, for uh, potential terrorist activity. And that didn't only happen in the United States, it also happened in other countries. Uh, one of the countries is Austria, where I come from. Austria also um, kind of changes laws, and the, under one of those laws, which is the anti-terrorist kind of uh, paragraph, uh, the way some people call it, in 2009, a group of animal rights activists were detained. Some of them were detained for one and a half years without knowing what the charges against them are under the Terrorist Act, and one of the indications that they might be a terrorist organization was that they used encrypted technologies to communicate. Now, I think that's a huge problem. What does that all mean? I think that, especially in a country like Austria, we have the, what we call in Germany, the, uh, or in Austria, the Briefgeheimnis, the right to privacy of communication. It's a constitutional law, and it's a law um, that we've had for a very long time. And um, we have a government in Austria currently that is thinking of uh, getting rid of that law. Um, and they, they're saying that, or some people in the government, they're saying that we don't need that law anymore because people are not sending each other letters anymore. So either they don't understand technology or they don't even understand uh, democracy. So because of that, I, I think that we need to talk about human rights, we need to talk about constitutional rights, and we need to talk about this in the context of the digital age. What does that mean for me personally? And it means that I feel conflicted because I see that I have this right, I live in a democracy, and I shouldn't worry about using encrypted technologies. But for the last 10 years, because of everything I just said, even though I understand technology, even though I know how to use encrypted means to communicate, even though I know how to use the Tor browser so that people cannot see my search history, I choose not to. Why? Because I think that my profile of Sherman Voschengear raises a lot of flags with certain institutions. Why? Um, my parents are from Iran. I have traveled to Iran back and forth a few times. I even at some point had a travel company um, uh, to Iran. I have a lot of Israeli friends. I work in blockchain, and my whole biography is all over the place. It's not very conventional, let's say. And given my social graph, I choose to be fully transparent. I choose to be fully transparent because I don't want to end up in an Afghanistan prison or, as a matter of fact, as we just saw, maybe in a prison in Austria without knowing what the charges against me are. And I think that is a problem because I shouldn't surrender. I shouldn't surrender and I should actually fight for the right to privacy of communication and I should fight for the right to encryption. So, I just said that the Internet is fundamentally broken, in a way. Um, there is a possibility to fix it. And the possibility that is presenting itself is we're currently reinventing the web. The technology that is driving that is blockchain, the technology behind Bitcoin. And it's driving kind of the next generation Internet. Some refer to it as the Web3. With blockchain technology, with this next generation Internet, we're 
changing our data structures from centralized to decentralized. And because of that, there is in those distributed, decentralized data structures, no single party controls our data. Um, we also have a payment layer in that new internet, and encryption comes embedded in the core technology. So I think that's a very, very good opportunity. But there is also a danger ahead, because it can go either way. We need to make sure that we have privacy by design, because currently, state-of-the-art blockchains are much more transparent than we think. People think Bitcoin is anonymous. That's a dangerous myth. It's not true. Bitcoin is what we call pseudonymous. So it's really hard for maybe you or me to track somebody's understand who, which per physical identity is behind a Bitcoin address. But if a government is interested, if you correlate the data um, uh, against enough other points, if you use AI, and if you invest enough time and money to figure out um, who an identity behind a Bitcoin address is, you can do that. And actually, governments have um, like Bitcoin because it's not really fully anonymous. So as we're entering this ne next generation of the internet, we're building new blockchains. And one of the blockchains that is experimenting with slightly different type of cryptography is, for example, Zcash. They're using a type of cryptography where you can choose to be fully anonymous or disclose what you're doing. And this is happening. And we were at kind of a verge. And um, the road is still open. If we look at where the Web3 is now, it's uh, comparable to where the internet was in the 90s. It's in the very early stages. This technology, this new generation internet is just an only forming. And we need to talk about the political aspects, about how we want to design this new internet before it manifests itself. Because depending on how we implement this technology, uh, depending on whether we have privacy by design, depending on the data structures, depending on the type of cryptography we use, it will either help us to create a freedom machine or a control machine. We have to understand that technology is just a tool. And the way we use that technology and the way we design that technology is always in our hands. And it's never a technological question, it's always a governance question, and it's a philosophical question. So I hope to have this debate around privacy and encryption. Thank you very much. Thank you.